Good morning and welcome to Roswell Presbyterian Church. I am so delighted that you are worshiping with us today, whether you are here in person or worshiping via live stream. We have a special day of worship planned. We have a baptism and a memory goal and a Stephen ministry commissioning. So it will be a good day to be together. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Please join me as we call ourselves to worship. The Lord proclaimed, I am the Alpha and the Omega, who is and was and who is to come, the Almighty God. And we shall pray and praise the Almighty God without ceasing. Please stand, whether in body or in spirit, and join us in our first hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling.
Thank you. You may be seated. The Gospels call us to turn away from our sin and to be faithful to Christ. We do that as we offer ourselves to God in penitence and in faith. And when we do that, we renew our confidence and we know that we are able to trust in God's mercy to forgive our sin. And therefore, uh, let us confess our failure to be the people that God has called us to be using the prayer of confession found in our order of service. Let us pray. God of mercy, we confess that we have failed to live as your beloved children. We have set our minds on the things of this world, and we have neglected the inheritance of love you bestow upon your saints. We have pursued selfish aims in our daily business. We have harbored uncharitable thoughts toward our enemies and friends. We have avoided difficult responsibilities to our neighbors. Forgive us, we pray. Free us from our selfish ways and strengthen us to be faithful followers of your love through Jesus Christ. Amen. God loved the world enough to send Jesus to earth as perfect love incarnate to die for us, that we might live through him. Assured of the grace of forgiveness of sin made known upon the cross, may we renew our commitment to love sacrificially and praise Jesus the Savior. We can hear and believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. in the Gloria Patri on our behalf. The Gloria Patri is one of their memory goals for this year. As you may know, we have memory goals from pre-K, three-year-olds really, all the way up to fifth grade. We want our children to know scripture on their hearts and the things that we do in worship. And so they will lead us on our behalf, but we want to make sure that we say thank you to their teachers, to the kindergarten teachers, Patty Cloy and Nancy Kilch and Charlie and Ashley Sears, and to our first grade teachers, Carl Carl and Susan Waller. and first graders, we thank you so much for leading us in worship. That was beautiful and a blessing to us all. Thank you so much. And now you all can return to your seats. And we have a very special time in our worship service. I'm going to invite the Gimmel family up for the sacrament of baptism and elder assisting Lisa Wiley. All right, 
this is such a special day. This is a special day for your family, but this is a special day for our church family where we are celebrating that God has claimed John and Caroline as part of God's family and nothing can ever separate them from God's love. So, Ryan and Ainsley, I have questions for you. Do you reaffirm your own faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? Do you claim God's covenant promises on your children's behalf, and do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation as you do for your own? Do you promise in reliance upon God's grace to set before John and Caroline an example of the new life in Christ? Do you promise to pray with and for them and to bring them up in the knowledge and love of God? And John, I have some questions for you. Do you know that God made you? Yes. Do you know that God loves you so much? Yes. And do you know that you are part of God's family? That is awesome. And Caroline, do you know that God made you? Do you know that God loves you so much? And do you know that you are part of God's family? Wonderful. Lisa has questions for the congregation. Do you, the members of this congregation and all believers everywhere, in the name of the whole Church of Christ, undertake with Ainsley and Ryan in the Christian nurture of John and Caroline so that in due time they may confess faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Do you? Will you, by your example and fellowship, endeavor to strengthen their family ties with the household of God. Will you? Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you so much for this time, for this outward symbol of an inward and spiritual grace. God, we thank you for the grace that you do pour out on each one of us. But especially today, we celebrate that for John and Caroline. So Lord, I pray that these waters would be set aside from a common to a sacred use. God, in that we would feel your presence in a very real way. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, John. John Edward Gimmel, child of the covenant, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. (laughs) Caroline, it's your turn. Caroline Elizabeth Ryan Gimmel, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now let us stand together and sing Child of Blessing. be seated. John and Caroline, I want you to look out there. You see all of these people, and some of the faces are people that you know. They're your friends from preschool or school or Sunday school, or maybe they live in your neighborhood, or you just see them around here. Taylor, that is right. He's going to be sad he missed this. But they are also your church family. You have your family at home, but this is your bigger family, your church family. And so these people out here have just made a promise that they are going to help teach you Sunday school and show God's love. And they're going to say hi to you when they see you. But we want you to know that you are a really special and important part of this church family. All right. Amen. And now I would like to invite some very special people to join me up front. Amy Wolverton, Jane Howland, Melanie Simon, Nancy Puckett, 
They are our newest class of Stephen ministers. Also, Bill Cox, who could not be here as part of their class. And then Mike Bangs is our Stephen leader that has been in charge of their training time. Scripture tells us in Galatians to bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. And this is truly what Stephen ministers do. They provide quality, Christ-centered care to people in the congregation and in the community that are experiencing life's difficulties. And to become a Stephen minister, you go through weekly training for six months. And so this fantastic group of people has just finished their training, and we are going to commission them into the faithful service of Stephen ministry. And we are so grateful for their commitment to serve God and the church in this way. And so Mike is going to ask them a question, and then we will pray for them. Okay. Do you commit to being a faithful Stephen minister following Jesus Christ to provide comfort to those in need? Let us pray. Holy God, I give you thanks for the gift that Stephen ministry is to so many that helps us to fulfill, fulfill our call to care for one another and to bear one another's burdens. I thank you for the many people that have served and continue to serve as Stephen ministers, and now especially for this new class, for Amy, for Jane, for Melanie, for Nancy, and for Bill. God, we pray that as they minister to others and as they seek to do your will through this call, that you would guide their every action, giving them the words to speak or the wisdom when not to speak, and a caring, calm presence to those in their care. We pray that when they encounter difficult situations, that they would feel your holy presence and peace, knowing that you are with them and will equip them every step of the way. We pray that their service would glorify you and point always to your light and love. And we know that we are all called in different ways. And it is my prayer that we would each continue to say yes to where you are calling us, so that each of us in our own way would do our part to care for your creation and all things in it. We ask you to help us, Lord, to do your will in our homes, in our communities, our workplaces, our neighborhoods, wherever we might be and with whomever we might encounter, so that we are sowing seeds that will bear the good fruit of the Spirit, that will bear the good fruit of love and peace, joy, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness, and self-control. And in those places in our world where there is discord and injustice and hatred and violence, we cry out deeply for you. And we lift those situations to you and pray for restoration and for healing. We ask for your help to equip each one of us to be vessels that you can use to do good and to share the good news of your love. We pray all of this in the way that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Carrie, and thank you for our Stephen ministers. Important vocation they are called to. Well, welcome to Roswell Presbyterian Church. It is a joy to be in worship with you. I want to let you know that this past Sunday, the session, the ruling body of our church, RPC, voted to reinstate the 815 service starting on March 6th. It was an answer to prayer to a lot of folks. And um, if 930 is not early enough, now you have an 815 option in the historic sanctuary. (laughs) 
you're kind of late for 8.15. <laughs> we continue our sermon series, The Short Stories of Jesus, looking at the parables of Jesus. Last week, we looked at the parable of the sower. It's a meta parable. It's a, a parable about parables. If you missed it, you can go and listen to it on the church website. But a parable is a story that you throw along your life. It helps you understand it. It illuminates your life, helps you understand creation, your purpose, helps you see how to, to flourish. And today we're going to look at one of Jesus' most famous parables, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And this past week I was going through my files, and I was like, surely I've preached or taught on the Good Samaritan. I mean, I can't find anything. And I was like, what kind of pastor and preacher would I be if I've never talked about the Good Samaritan? Well, you're looking at him. And so we're going to do that today, and I'm really looking forward to exploring this, this great short story. But before I read it, Jesus is in a conversation with a lawyer. And I always, being married to a lawyer, I always love Jesus kind of sparring rhetorically with lawyers. I can learn a lot. And the lawyer stands up to test Jesus, it says. And he asks this question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus responds with a question, what is written in the law? And the lawyer quotes the two great commandments. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. And that's where our text takes up today. Luke 10, verses 29 through 37. But wanting to justify himself, the lawyer that is, but wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three, do you think, was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And he said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we ask that in the next few moments you might be our teacher, that you might teach us about neighborliness, kindness, compassion, for our world desperately needs it. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Won't you be my neighbor? This was the famous question Mr. Rogers asked children who watched his daily television show, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. In an interview, Fred Rogers said, won't you be my neighbor is an invitation. It's an invitation for a person to know they are loved and capable of loving. Won't you be my neighbor is an invitation for a person to know that they are loved and capable of loving. In a world bereft of kindness and compassion and love, this question, won't you be my neighbor, can seem radical. If the question, won't you be my neighbor, is an invitation, the question the lawyer asks Jesus is one of self-justification. The Bible says, 
the lawyer, wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And in response, Jesus tells a parable. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, this man, this traveler, is a generic man. Jesus gives us no details about his religion, about his nationality, about his height or his weight. He's a person, and that's all we need to know. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and the man travels down that road, that notorious road from Jerusalem to Jericho was about 17 miles long. On the road, you would descend about 3,300 feet steep. There were numerous narrow passages, dangerous blind corners. Robbers and bandits were known to hide there, trying to terrorize would-be travelers. A man was going down this dangerous road from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Jesus ominously begins his story of a man traveling a perilous path, and sure enough, robbers attack. Attack this man, strip him, and beat him, and leave him half dead. There's nothing left to identify this man, this man lying on the side of the road. His possessions have been taken, his clothes have been stripped and discarded, and he's suffering from severe injuries. This is a person who can't help himself. He is quite literally helpless. Have you ever found yourself in a helpless predicament? Maybe you've stumbled into financial catastrophe. Maybe you've been on the road and been attacked by bandits and now your family is in shambles. Maybe you've fallen sick, lost a job, been betrayed by a friend. Have you found yourself in a place where you're helpless, where you quite literally can't help yourself? You're lying on the side of the road in need of help. This man is in desperate straits. He needs help. Oh, look, around the corner. Jesus says, now by chance, a priest was going down that road. This is great news. A religious professional, a priest is coming. Surely he will help. And Jesus continues. And when he, the priest, saw him, he passed by on the other side. Oh, no, I... I thought we were in such good hands with a priest. But the priest passed by and continues on. Oh, wait, here comes comes somebody else. Jesus continues, so likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, another religious professional, surely he will help the suffering man. And Jesus says he saw him and passed by on the other side. Why did the priest and the Levite pass by? Why did they fail to help this helpless man suffering on the side of the road? Many reasons have been given over the years. Some have said the priest was in a hurry to get to the temple. But for for close readers of this parable, that clearly can't be the case. The priest is going from Jerusalem to Jericho. He's going in the opposite direction of the temple. Well, maybe these religious professionals, this priest and this Levite, maybe they don't want to become ritually unclean by touching a corpse. But again, a close reading says that Jesus says the man is not dead, but half dead. And nevertheless, Jewish law in many places says that saving a life supersedes all other commands. The priest and the Levite fail to do what they are commanded to do. They fail to take care of the suffering man on the side of the road. But why? Maybe one of the most poignant explanations for their refusal comes in a sermon that Martin Luther King Jr. gave towards the end of his life. It was on the product, the parable of the Good Samaritan. 
And he says about these two men, he says, I'm going to tell you what my imagination tells me. It's possible that these men were afraid. King continues, and so the first question that the priest and the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? What will happen to me? These two men are afraid. They're thinking about self-preservation. Surely the robbers and the bandits who attack this man are lurking in the shadows. We can't risk it. What will happen to me? And so the priest and the Levite continue on their way. Now, in good storytelling, there's a convention called the Rule of Three. And the Rule of Three allows for you to give two names in a series, and then your audience can fill in the third name. So, for example, for fans of slapstick comedy, Larry, Curly, and... For Trinitarian theologians, Father, Son, and Shakespeare fans, Friends, Romans, Brooklyn Nets fans, Durant, Harden, and Kyrie. (laughs) For Jesus' listeners, this lawyer and all the Israelites that were listening to Jesus tell this parable, know who's coming next. They know who's coming down the road next. They know who the hero of the story is going to be. First, we had the priest, and he's failed to help the man. Second, we have the the Levite, and he's failed to help the man. Who's coming next is going to be the hero of the story. Surely it's a priest, a Levite, and an Israelite. We know who the the hero of the story is going to be, right? And in one of the great bombshell endings in storytelling history, Jesus says, it's a priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan. Just at the point where they think they know where the story is going, Jesus says, but a Samaritan while traveling came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. A Samaritan, can you believe it? This would have blown the minds of his listeners. This would have exploded all their expectations and assumptions about the way the world is set up. Samaritans had a notorious reputation that they'd had for hundreds of years. They originated from the northern country in Samaria. If you read in the Old Testament, the Assyrians come in and conquer the northern kingdom. Those former Israelites intermarry with non-Israelites and they become Samaritans. They're known as unclean people, descended from mixed marriages. They're the kind of the epitome of corruption. Religiously, they worship not in Jerusalem, but in this town, Gerizim. They're seen as flawed, outcasts. There were all sorts of slurs about Samaritans. One rabbinic text reads, one who eats the food of Samaritans is eating the food of swine. And just when his listeners are least expecting it, Jesus makes the hero of the story a Samaritan. A Samaritan is moved with pity and compassion for this man on the side of the road who lays there helpless. This word that we translate pity or compassion has to do with when you feel it in your guts, it's almost a visceral reaction moved in your soul, and this Samaritan runs to this man's side, bandages his wounds, pours oil and wine on them, and he goes the extra mile, puts him on his own animal, and takes him to an inn, gives money for him to stay, and says, take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. And so Jesus finishes the story, and then he turns to the lawyer who asked the original question, who gave him occasion to tell the story in the first place. And Jesus says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And in front of this vast audience, the lawyer gives his answer. And notice he can't even say out loud the word Samaritan. He says, the one who showed him mercy. The one who showed him mercy, and Jesus said to him, 
go and do likewise. The Samaritan was the man's neighbor, the most unlikely of people to show compassion and kindness and love. The person we least thought likely to be the neighbor was the neighbor, not because of who he was, but because of what he did. The Samaritan demonstrates the love of God and love of neighbor through concrete action. It matters what he does, not about his nationality or where he comes from, but about taking care of the man who's helpless on the side of the road. In his sermon, Martin Luther King preached, the priest and the Levite asked, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But then the Samaritan, the good Samaritan came by and he reversed the question. If I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? What will happen to him? Not a question of fear rooted in self-preservation. If I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? This is the question we must ask ourselves if we aim to love our neighbors. King went on in that sermon, that sermon about the Good Samaritan, and applied it to his own life. Many of his friends and followers were trying to get him not to go, to refrain to go to Memphis. But he says, I have to go and advocate for the rights of the sanitation workers there. And he asked, what will happen if I don't go? And then King went to Memphis, and on April 4th, he was assassinated. There are bandits on the road. So how can we learn to love our neighbor as Jesus commands us to? I want to return to the question that the lawyer first asked Jesus before he even tells the parable. Remember, the lawyer asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do? And Jesus says, follow the two great commands, loving God and loving neighbor. But what this man knows, this lawyer, what he knows is what we all know, is that it is an impossible task to live up to this high calling. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are all in one way or another, whether it's spiritually, emotionally, or physically, we've all been wounded, beaten down, bruised. We are a broken people on the side of the road. And who has crossed that road to come to us? But God revealed in Jesus Christ. God has shown us kindness, compa compassion, and love. God has crossed time and space to say, I love you in the grandest way possible by giving his life for the life of the world. He has helped us when we could not help ourselves. God is the ultimate good Samaritan coming to the rescue of the man on the side of the road suffering. And so when we, when we show kindness and compassion and love, we reflect that divine love that God has shown us. And that love relativizes all boundaries and distinctions. God's love shines. And we are all children of God. God's light shines on us. And it's not about who we are, our nationality, our race, our political party. It's about what we do. If we reflect God's love and God's kindness into the world, that kindness can change a life. The writer Tom Junid once wrote about how he used to be a cynical, angry, and frustrated reporter. His editor thought it would his editor was at Esquire magazine. He thought it'd be funny to assign Tom to do a profile of Mr. Rogers. That interview and their subsequent friendship changed Tom's life. It ended up becoming the basis of the movie, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. And when the movie came out a few years ago, Tom Junid, who at the time lived in East Cobb, wrote an article for the Atlantic magazine. And it talked about how that friendship changed his life. How Mr. Rogers showed him kindness and love even though he was a complete stranger. Tom writes, 
A long time ago, a man of resourceful and relentless kindness saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. He trusted me when I thought I was untrustworthy and took an interest in me that went beyond my initial interest in him. He was the first person I ever wrote about who became my friend. Our friendship endured till he died. The movie called A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood seems like a culmination of the gifts that Fred Rogers gave me and all of us. Gifts that fit the definition of grace because they feel, at least in my case, undeserved. I still don't know what he saw in me, why he decided to trust me, or what to this day he wanted from me, if anything at all. That's what happens when a good Samaritan comes to your aid, to your rescue, when you're on the side of the road. No matter what someone looks like, what their politics are, where they worship, or who they are, we are all broken and in need of love. And God in Jesus Christ is the good Samaritan who has come to us. And then Jesus says to that lawyer, what he says to all of us, go and do likewise. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you that you've come to us in Jesus Christ. You've shown us great kindness and compassion and grace. We pray that it might fill us up and flow into a world that desperately needs it. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. It is good to be here uh, today with each one of you, and we want to know that you are here. And so what we are asking for you to do is to get your phones out. Some of you are used to this uh, little routine that we try to do each, each week, whether you're here in the sanctuary or, or whether you are uh, watching on streaming. And we'd like for you to uh, text the number that you see behind me or on your screen. And if you are here uh, often, we'd like for you to text the word here. And if you're our guest today, we'd like for you to text the word welcome. For we want you to know that we are glad that you are here. We thank you for worshiping with us. And uh, we want you to know that it is a privilege for us. Uh, for you to be here. If you don't have your phone, or if you prefer, you can fill out one of the cards that should be in front of you in the, uh, in the pew racks and drop it in the basket uh, as you leave, along with your, along with your gifts. For as we, as we listen uh, to the anthem in a moment, may we consider what it means to go and do likewise.
Let us pray. No gift, no act of service or caring or mercy is pleasing to you, O God, unless it is given with a willing mind and a loving heart. Accept these acts and gifts of love we bring. Allow them to be our way of going and doing likewise, of showing mercy and grace to the lonely and distressed and deprived as you have found us on the side of the road in need and helped. As we pray in Jesus' name, amen. And now let us sing our closing hymn, sing praise to God who reigns above. It has been a joy to be in worship with you this morning. Raise your hand if you think there's just too much kindness in the world. No, no one says that. This week, let us remember what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, helping us when we were helpless on the side of the road, being the good Samaritan to us. But then also let us remember that command to go and do likewise. The world desperately needs it. As you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love. And all God's people said, amen.